excited to welcome our next speaker. He's also been a colleague for a number of years here and probably the biggest Michigan fan of all the physicians around, uh, Dr. Scott McLean uh, from the uh, Department of Otolaryngology. Thanks, Chris, and thanks everybody for having me here today. I, um, I really appreciated Dr. Sable's talk on completion lymph node dissection, and uh, t I would like to add some information about the unique aspects of melanoma in the head and neck. <clears throat> Didn't need a disclosure slide, but I have none. And so Chris mentioned it, I am a huge Michigan fan. Uh, hopefully most of you know who Bo Schembechler is and what he taught us about being a member of a team. And the, the team we have here at Michigan is one reason that uh, we are so successful in, in treating our patients with melanoma. And um, I was in the Michigan marching band way back in the day, so I got to, I got to actually meet Bo Schembechler a few times. And this is what he told me. He said, uh, think what a great thing it is to be a part of the Michigan melanoma team. And so that was my goal coming out of, out of college. Actually, he didn't really say that, but I, I, like to, I like to imagine that he told me that. I did meet him, though. He's a great leader. So here, uh, we like to apply the NCCN guidelines uh, within our multidisciplinary melanoma program. And so every patient that comes in to see us here gets uh, a review of their pathology. And that's actually a, a really important first step. Uh, about 15% of the time when someone comes in with a diagnosis of melanoma, when our pathologists review that, they actually change the diagnosis. Maybe not from melanoma to something else, but the depth of invasion might change. Or the other risk factors that are associated with that biopsy could change. And that could change the way that we treat uh, that particular melanoma. Every patient gets a complete history and physical exam, a complete skin exam, and a complete lymph node exam. We only obtain imaging if we suspect that there's metastatic disease. And then we start to talk about how do we decide how much to take. If we're going to take that lesion out, where do we measure? Where do we draw the line on how much skin we want to remove? And so we follow guidelines for that. And it's basically based on the depth of invasion of that primary lesion. So the deeper it goes, the further away we want to resect. Uh, but the most we ever do is about two centimeters. Um, Dr. Sable talked about way back in the day they used to do the wide excision plus everybody got a complete lymph node dissection. They also used to think that four centimeters was better than two centimeters. And we've learned over time that if you get out two centimeters away from the, what you can measure on the skin, there's a very high chance you're going to uh, get completely around that and have a lower recurrence rate. Sentinel lymph node biopsy is uh, something that became very important, as Dr. Sable pointed out. And uh, we use this based on the, the depth of invasion. So anybody who has a lesion that's more than a millimeter deep, we offer this sentinel lymph node biopsy. And that's because we believe there's an increased risk of finding a positive sentinel lymph node. If it's less than a millimeter, so 0.76 to up to a millimeter, if there are other adverse features that we see, like ulceration or a high mitotic rate, again, on that pathology report, then we would offer that sentinel lymph node biopsy. So what makes the head and neck unique? Well, the most important thing is the anatomy. Uh, and the anatomy leads to the lymphatic drainage patterns. And then, of course, on your face, it's a very important functional and cosmetic area. And so we, we take very great care in trying to restore function and cosmesis. So the anatomy is very complex in the head and neck. Uh, and, you know, this is just a simple... Uh, drawing that has been around for decades. And you can see there's a lot of muscles in the face that move your face, give you facial expression. There are a lot of nerves, a lot of blood vessels, uh, both in the face and in the neck. There's nerves that move every muscle of your face. There's nerves that move your tongue. There's a nerve that goes down to your shoulder that helps you raise your arm up over your head. And so when you're operating in the head and neck, you have to know where all of these things are. 
And you have to be very careful around each one of those nerves so you don't injure that nerve and cause a permanent injury to that nerve. There are a lot of blood vessels in the head and neck. The carotid artery, the jugular vein, you could easily, if you don't know where these are, get into those structures and cause bleeding, uh, which can be a major uh, problem with surgery. And so surgeons talking about the head and neck and sentinel lymph node biopsy when this first came out were very reluctant to do lymph node biopsies in the head and neck because of this potential risk to all of these structures. This is um, looking at the lymphatic drainage patterns for, for the head and neck. It's, it was thought that these were very complex and not as predictable as something that maybe arose on the arm and you knew it was going to go to a certain node in the, in the armpit or something on the leg going to the groin. Surgeons across the country still to this day debate whether or not you can map a primary tumor on the skin of the face and predictably find the lymph node in the neck that it drains to. And that's because of this complex anatomy. Over the years, we've, we've learned that we can do better at finding those nodes. So there's something we utilize here at Michigan called a SPEC CT. So, so a sentinel lymph node, the way it's done, and Dr. Sable had that nice cartoon showing that you inject some, and we call it some dye, into the skin around that primary spot. That dye will drain someplace, and for me it's into the neck somewhere. And it used to be that we'd get these images like on the top here showing these dark shadows. That's, that's the lymphocentigraphy. And so the, the uh, nuclear medicine doctors would say, here's your patient, we did that injection for you, and that node is in the, in the, uh, the left neck. And we'd have these shadows to look at, and we'd say, oh, great. How are we going to find that? And, it's, and we have a little handheld detector, so this is a nuclear dye. It's got a little radioactive signal on it. And we'd use that little detector to try to detect where in the neck it is. Now we've come to where we can fuse that image with a CT scan that's done. So this is called SPEC CT. And we get these images before surgery, and that orange spot will, will light up for us. And we can say, okay, I know exactly where that node is. I know exactly what the structures are all around it. I know what muscle is there. I know what nerve is there. And we can make a small incision and carefully dissect down and find that lymph node and take it out. So the, the uh, University of Michigan group about uh, seven or eight years ago now started looking at our data on sentinel lymph node biopsy for the head and neck. And what we showed is just like the other body sites, we can reliably find that lymph node. 99% um, of the time we find that node. Uh, in this, again, in experienced hands, so surgeons who operate in the head and neck every day. We can find that node. Um, and we found that about 20% of the time that node was positive. Just like the other body sites, there's about a 20% risk of finding a positive lymph node. In those patients, we, went, we did go on to do the, the completion lymph node dissection, and the data is very similar. 25% of the patients who had a positive sentinel lymph node had a positive non-sentinel lymph node in that completion lymph node dissection. We also admit this isn't a perfect study. About 4% of people who had a negative sentinel lymph node, when we followed them over time, did have a recurrence in that nodal basin. So that was a node that we didn't find with our sentinel lymph node biopsy. And this data is very similar to the other body sites. So for those uh, arguments across the country that still happen, that the head and neck is different, it's unique, you can't find the sentinel node, we would say here at Michigan, we can find the node, it's very predictable, and it does predict um, it does predict better outcomes uh, comparing a negative node to a positive node. More on the NCCN guidelines, and these may change based on the new studies that have come out, but this is talking about principles of completion lymph node dissection. And for me, this, um, this last bullet point here is, is specifically talking about the head and neck. 
Um, and it specifically here says, for microscopically positive lymph nodes in the parotid gland, a superficial parotidectomy and appropriate neck dissection of the draining nodal basin is recommended. Now this is where I, I differ a little from the NCCN guidelines. I always wondered, if, you're, if you have a positive lymph node in the parotid gland, why do they recommend a superficial parotidectomy? And my wonder was based on my knowledge of the anatomy. So even back when Dr. Netter made these drawings, if you look at the very top right of the screen there, it says superficial parotid nodes, and then in parentheses it says deep parotid nodes, deep to the parotid gland. There are lymph nodes in the deep lobe of the parotid gland. So the parotid gland is a salivary gland. It sits in front of your ear here. And it has lymph nodes within it. And so a head and neck melanoma can travel to that parotid gland, and it can go to the lymph nodes either in the superficial part of the gland or in, into the lymph nodes in the deep part of that gland. And so I always said, and, and I still go to national meetings and stand up and ask the expert panels, do you do a total parotidectomy or just a superficial parotidectomy for metastatic disease to the parotid gland? And there's debate. Nobody knows the right answer to that. So we started studying that here. So we know there are lymph nodes in the deep lobe of the parotid gland. We know that melanoma can metastasize to those nodes. And we also know that if a melanoma recurs in your parotid bed or the area where you operate on that parotid, parotid gland, it can have a significant impact on your quality of life. So within that gland is that major nerve that controls all the muscles of your face called the facial nerve. And the reason surgeons have been reluctant to operate in the deep lobe of the parotid gland is you have to gently move that nerve out of the way to get that tissue out. And, and people speculate that if you, if you do that, you manipulate that nerve too much, you'll end up paralyzing the face. So we tried to study that here. And this uh, is a retrospective study looking at our patients where we did a total parotidectomy versus superficial parotidectomy. We just published this data last year. And what this showed was we had zero recurrences in the parotid bed when we did a total parotidectomy compared to a 13% recurrence rate within that parotid bed when we, when we left that tissue deep to the nerve. And so we know from anatomy, and now we know from following our patients very closely that if we take a little bit more tissue out there, very carefully, we can lower the recurrence rate. We measured facial nerve function after we did these surgeries, and there was no difference between those two groups. So when you're careful and you carefully get that tissue out, you don't paralyze the nerve. We also know that in that 13% that recurred in that area, about half of those patients ended up with facial nerve paralysis because of that recurrent cancer. And so actually, if you looked long term now, the facial nerve function in, is worse in that group that didn't get the total parotidectomy because they had a recurrence of their cancer there and, and then needed more surgery, which then caused more problems. So these are some unique um, aspects of the head and neck that we really need to think about when we're deciding, do we delay surgery? Do we do surgery up front? Um, should we be more aggressive? And these still, as Dr. Sable pointed out, for every individual patient, this is an important discussion. And, and people often ask me the same question. Well, what would you do? What would you do if this was your dad or your brother or your wife? And the truth is, I'm not sitting there in that position, so I don't really know. And the best I can do is have a thorough discussion, tell you what all of your options are, and then we make a decision together on how to proceed. What about functional and cosmetic outcomes? So all of us want to look normal. We all want to have normal function. We want to be able to have normal facial expressions. And so our first goal is cure. We want to make sure we do the right thing up front to try to cure you of the melanoma. But then we also want to focus on the best way to restore full function. We want to minimize scarring on the face. And, and so we can do that by hiding our incision lines in, in normal creases or normal wrinkles that we all develop. Uh, 
Uh, there are shadow lines in the face that we could try to hide those incision lines in. And people often ask me, you know, as, as we're talking about doing this big resection, you know, should we get a plastic surgeon to come in and maybe close things up so it looks a little better? And I like to say, well, you're in luck. I actually am a facial plastic surgeon. So I did spend some extra time doing a fellowship in facial plastic surgery, which, which just gives us the foundation on principles of reconstruction. These are just a few photos of some outcomes. So this is actually a patient whose nose had a skin graft on it. Skin grafts can be very functional, and they can blend in nicely over time. This was a patient who lost almost half of his nose. And you can see what we did here was, uh, it's called a forehead flap reconstruction. So we borrowed the tissue from his forehead and rebuilt the whole side, his, his, the right side of his nose there is actually tissue that came from his forehead. And it's not perfect, but uh, it also, you know, if you're walking down the street, this would not draw attention to you. It looks, looks like a normal nose. This is a patient who had a good portion of his ear removed, and you can see we can do some local tissue rearrangement, taking some skin from behind the ear to reconstruct that ear and, and make that have a normal shape to it. This is a woman who had actually about a third of the right side of her face removed from a melanoma that she had. And we borrowed some skin from lower in the neck and rotated that up. And if you met her today, you wouldn't know that she had that done. So there's lots of ways that we can reconstruct the face. We can achieve good outcomes with normal facial movement and normal function. So we have a new coach in town. And he was here a long time ago. He played for Bo Beckler, And I'm pretty sure this is what he told him when he pulled them aside, tell them to find a cure. And he's got his own saying now. He says, attack melanoma with an, un, an, an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. I'm pretty sure I heard him scream this the other day. So we're trying to do that here. And this aim at melanoma uh, event today is part of that. Uh, but we have a lot going on. We have research going on as well. Uh, as you all know, early stage melanoma is highly curable, uh, but survival decreases in patients found to have metastasis. Uh, development of distant disease causes the majority of melanoma related deaths, and we're not very good at predicting an individual susceptibility to developing distant disease. We know if you have a regional metastasis to a lymph node, you're at much higher risk of developing distant disease but we still don't know which individual person is going to go on to develop that problem. And we cur so we cur re currently rely on that nodal disease um, burden to help us predict that, but we still are looking for ways to, to be better. And one thing we've started doing here at Michigan is looking uh, for something called circulating tumor cells. We know that a cell can get into the bloodstream, and that's how it could spread to somewhere else in your body. But we don't have a way to measure that, and we're working on that. So we do have a lab that I work with. Dr. Nagrath is a chemical engineer here at Michigan, and she actually developed this device. She calls it the Oncobean chip. It was first developed looking at breast cancer and lung cancer. And I, I called her and said, hey, could you help us make one of these to, de to detect melanoma cells? And we do have a device now. It's not, uh, it's not commercially available. It's not yet ready for use, widespread use. But we have found that when we draw blood from patients with melanoma, we can flush it through this device, and we can detect circulating tumor cells. And so we're really trying to figure out what does that mean. Is there a certain number of cells that's a predictor of bad outcomes? Um, we really don't know. It's very early in the development of this. Uh, but we think we're onto something, and we're going to keep trying to study that and, and see where that leads us. And as part of that, I started something called the Victor's Melanoma Research Team. And uh, we all have events, and, and I like to see that walk. I'm actually I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to that walk uh, next Sunday. But next Saturday is something I call the tailgate to tackle melanoma. 
And I, as you probably have figured out, I'm a big Michigan fan. So I tailgated every game. But I decided three years ago that the Michigan-Michigan State game was going to be our big melanoma fundraiser. So it's our tailgate to tackle melanoma. And this year that's going to be um, a night game, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but at the clubhouse on the golf course, right across from Michigan Stadium, we, we've rented that space to host our tailgate. And you all are invited. There's some postcards up front if you want to grab one of those. Um, I'd love to see you there. I also am, am an avid runner, and I run one or two marathons a year. So every time I do one of those, I uh, raise money for melanoma research. And this year I'll be running the Honolulu Marathon in December. I've run Boston several times, and last year I did New York City. And sometimes I'll, I'll do that in association with other groups. Like last year I did the Melanoma Education Foundation, which is a group that raises money for specifically to send programs out to area schools uh, to teach kids about the risks of melanoma. So anyway, if you can join us at the tailgate, that'd be great. And again, go blue, and thank you for your time.